Hello, everyone. I just wanted to say thank you, everybody, for joining us for Pop Madness 2021. Um, we are, as you can see, virtual this year. Um, and I wanted to say a huge thank you for you uh, sticking with us through this virtual time and for coming to our panel, a conversation with Martha Wells. Um, I want to introduce, first of all, uh, Amanda Tillman, our moderator. Um, thank you very much for moderating for us today. Amanda is a professor and an admin at uh, Geek Girls Brunch and a con veteran and a big fan of Martha's writing. So she was the perfect person to host for us today. Um, and then Martha Wells, of course, Hugo award-winning author, awesome books. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and take myself out of the picture as it were. Um, if anybody has questions, we will be taking questions later. So please feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, and just in case there are any technical problems, I just wanna state for the record right now, I am not a cat, um, but hopefully we'll be good. So I will let y'all take it away. Okay, well, Hi, Ms. Martha. You know, Hi. <laughs> how are you doing today? Oh, I'm pretty good. How are you? I am pretty good. I'm glad it's not snowing again. Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm having a, a calm day. That was pretty awful. <laughs> True. Okay, so I thought that we would get started um, and touch base on the stuff you got. You got published last year, since I know a lot of people are going to be looking forward to Murderbot, but I do also want to like get some shout outs for the fact that you actually do publish things through the year that aren't Murder Murderbot as well. Okay, uh, I think the first thing, I, I actually just looked at this earlier this morning, so that's good, so I can actually remember everything. Um, I did a chapter of a cereal box cereal called Machina, um, and cereal box does uh, uh, ebook and audio serials where they put up a, a, a section each week and some other stuff is um, media tie-in I think they did Orphan Black and I think they've done Thor and some others but a lot of it is original science fiction and fantasy um, Machina is a near future um, somewhat post-apocalyptic look at an attempt to make an AI capable of terraforming Mars and it focuses on these computer groups, these two different groups of programmers and um, who are trying to um, uh, basically compete to uh, be the ones to be able to, to finish the design and be able to do this. And so they've got their kind of personal competitions with each other. And they've also got the fact that if somebody doesn't pull it together and get this done, then a lot of people are gonna die. So it's a really interesting serial, and it's actually conceived and written by Fran Wild um, with Malka Older and Curtis Chen, and they did most of it. And I came in and did uh, one of the chapters, um, and it was it's a really great story. So that came out in between February and March. It was posted a chapter per week, and I think there's like ten or twelve chapters. It's a pretty long story. Um, then I did. Um, there was a story, a murder bot short story that was given away free by Tor.com to people who um, um, pre-ordered uh, Network Effect, and that'll be coming out. It's in the it's in the the um, the special collection that's coming out from uh, Subterranean Press, and it's going to be in the uh, trade paperback of Network Effect. So that should be out, uh, I think, in May or April or May, and this year. Uh, Network Effect itself came out. It came out in hardcover in May during not too long after we got locked down in the pandemic. So I didn't get to do any events for that that weren't online. So that was interesting. Uh, and it still did pretty well. So that was nice. Um, what were you going to say? I was going to say, I do have to give a shout out. I did love Home. Um, oh, yeah. yeah because uh, the one that came with Network Effect, because yeah. it was our first new POV. Yeah. Uh, so it's the first thing with Dr. Mensa's POV, so yeah. Um, and then I did recently, I did, um, oh, I also did a short story for a free anthology given out by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation about the future of health and healthcare. I did a, um, um, a story that came out in November in Uncanny Magazine, and it's free online, and then there's, there's the print version of that in that you, or the e-version of that in the magazine. And it also has a podcast version where the audio version, and it's called The Salt Witch. And 
uh, that's still online for free and at the Uncanny Magazine site. And um, I also did a, a short story called Bespin Escape and it's in a Star Wars Empire Strikes Back anthology called From a Certain Point of View, which is a, free, which is a, um, a charity anthology raising money for first book, which gets children, early, chil uh, early children's books out to uh, kids who, who wouldn't otherwise be able to buy them. Um, and I think that's it. Oh, I had a couple of reprinted Raxura books. Uh, the original Raxura publisher Nightshade Books put out a couple more of the books in uh, mass market paperback. Um, also, I just want to give you a shout out because I did see this on Uncanny Magazine that Salt Witch won the 2020 Favorite Fiction Reader. Yeah, that was nice. It was it was like the there's like a I think it was a top five or six or seven stories mm -hmm. this year. Yeah, so that was really a surprise. I didn't think I hadn't I haven't I don't do a lot of short stories. It took me that one took me about a year to write. So um, that was nice that people liked it enough to vote for it for that. I definitely loved it. I didn't know about the voting, but um, I do like the the reclaiming of power and things for our, our lovely women and how that it's sort of a ghosty story. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, I was trying to describe it uh, when people were asking about it. It's, it's a happy story about dying in a hurricane. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> And that's, and it's about, it's based on a real place that's, that's really important to me. So, uh, oh. and the main character is based on, or her name comes from one of my aunts. So yeah, it was, it was a really personal story. That's so awesome to know. Also, because one of our lovely people just did this over in the chat. If you are looking for the Salt Witch, which is the short story we're talking about, someone did toss up the link so that you can go read it. Oh, cool. Okay. So I'm going to head into some questions that are sort of, they're gonna mention Murderbot, but this is more about you. Okay. So first, um, one of our lovely librarians, because um, I'm gonna, I'll mention it here and there. I pulled a lot of people because I know a lot of people who read your stuff um, to see like what kinds of questions they were looking for. And this was a really brilliant one. We look at how Murderbot learns how to interact with the world through especially his favorite ah. cereal. Sorry, that was my cat smacking a candle. <laughs> um, so what, what importance or not importance, importance does um, like your life, is it impacted by, by media, by fandom? Like, does that help shape who you are? Uh, very much so. Um, when I was a kid, we didn't have, this was before cable television where you literally had like whatever you could get on broadcast, which was generally, you know, four, you know, the four network, three networks, PBS, and then independent stations. And we had maybe five total and one of the independent stations showed Star Trek the one we could sort of barely get one was also um, showed a lot of Godzilla movies and it showed a lot of Earl, old Irwin Allen stuff like Land of the Giants which I absolutely love <clears throat> you never hear about it now but it was a great series actually it was really clever and you know the Sequest and all that kind of thing and um so I kind of grew up on that. And I was always as a kid trying to write stories and <clears throat> I would do things like take pieces of typing paper, drawing paper and make giant maps, puzzle maps, kind of a monster island and stuff like that. Excuse me. I love it. I don't know why my throat's already going, but um, I know. What so, yeah, it was just really early on. And I, you know, and I love Star Wars fanfic. I got, I was a big Star Wars fan when it first came out when I was 13. Um, that's kind of how I got into fandom first. And then later when I went to college, um, the Texas A&M University had a, um, a, a science fiction fantasy student group and they did AggieCon, which was a big deal at that time. It was a um, convention with maybe 2000 people attending at its height. Um, so I got involved in that. So when kind of met a lot of authors through that and kind of got involved in going to conventions and, and that kind of fandom. So yeah, I've been to fan, involved in fandom for a long time and, and TV and movies have been really important influences on me, um, which is kind of, it's now I think it's coming, it's starting to get um, more common to admit that. And I don't know if it's just because it's, it's people that actually kind of grew up really being, um, with science fiction fancy on TV are finally starting to get to the age where they're, you know, at, you know, and they grew up with fanfic also are putting out books and stuff. And, 
where we you know the the when fanfic moved from fanzines to being online, it became a lot more accessible uh, to to more people. You didn't have to know you know where to go and all that kind of thing. You could just go and find it with a search. Um, so I think that's you know more people are starting to talk about their their TV influences and how um, like for particularly Murderbot basically learns how to deal with its emotions via the shows it watches um that's something that actually happens to real people um who have been helped by that um and i think it, it's in it, tv's that kind of um as a comfort um not just as an inspiration but as actually comfort and company is starting to come become more accepted because there was a period like in the in the 90s probably early 90s when I was first getting my first book was coming out and I was on the old genie system where it's like it was so snobbish for a long time it's like we did not talk about the television machine or whatever that line is I think it's from I love Lucy or something but um and which is really kind of a um uh, a really snobby attitude and because it 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 TV and movies are their own art form. And just because they're different from books doesn't mean you can't enjoy both, you know? Um, so yeah, it is it, that Murderbot's um, media that it watches, it's, it is kind of really personal to me. And that's kind of why I make the different TV shows um, are all kind of semi-based on real shows to a certain extent. Yeah. Okay, so taking that, because you just said like your your background actually is in fandom like your feet are all wet in that how have you done um, or how do you feel about slash navigate that you have now gone from that gray space um and crossed the line from i'm in fandom because i love all these things to you actually now exist as part of a like part of the pillars in fandom uh because people love these books yeah it's been really weird but it's it's interesting because i've been doing this for like 28 years and so most of the time, you know, people never heard of me. <laughs> you know, I was, my first books were fairly obscure. I think the death of the necromancer got a little bit of attention. Excuse me. And then I had a career crash around 2008 or so where I did, had like four years, I think, where I, nothing came out and I couldn't sell anything. Um, and then I finally, I got a different agent and finally, you know, sold the Rexera books. And then I did a Star Wars novel I'd already done a couple of Stargate Atlantis novels before my career crash. And then, you know, I did some other stuff. And, and so I've never been like super popular up until Murderbot. It's like, it was a very slow climb or it's like, well, I, it was a very slow climb. And then it went down to nothing. I had to kind of had to start completely over because really it is amazing. It's like it, after four years, I went back when I started, I could afford to go to conventions again. It's like so many people just not heard of me and or had any idea that I was an author um so it was just really it was I was like it was kind of what I expected but because I had not you know I had not been very well known before that but it's just kind of disheartening when you have to kind of start all over from the beginning and so it was a slow climb again and um I think it was at the point where I was doing pretty okay and then I actually wrote Murderbot it's a novella. It's only like 30,000, 34,000, something like that, words long, uh, for the tour novella program. And it was, I actually got the idea. I was finishing up the last Raxura book, The Harbors of the Sun. And I was just having, I was almost at the end of this really difficult draft and was having a, just ideas, crazy ideas all the time. And that was one of them. And it was really originally going to be a short story. And so wrote it and it, came out and just for some reason took off and, uh, <laughs> and it's just kind of been getting more and more popular as it goes along so that's just been really just really bananas to see that happen um so I'm, I'd seen I think I'd seen a little bit of fanfic for my earlier books you know occasionally you know just like a few stories because uh, people I did have fans it was just like it was very very tiny small group um but now it's like, it's, I'm starting to get a lot of fanfic and fan art and I can't read, I don't read the fanfic for stuff that I'm still working on. Mm -hmm. So I'll read it for my older books that I'm not going back to, but um, 
the new stuff I can't really look at. I can look at the fan art. Yeah. And um, someone did an absolutely lovely animated uh, video for Murderbot um, that was just incredible. And that kind of, st and this, this, all this beautiful fan art you see, it's just like, it's just, it's just so cool. I love that. Also, I forgot to mention this earlier in our works from 2020, 21. You actually just put out an illustrated version of, well, it's, it's coming out. I know it had pre-orders. Yeah. Um, it's the one from Subterranean. Subterranean does um, a lot of, they do their own, some original novellas, but I think they do mostly do the fancy editions of fa fancy re illustrated reprints. And this is um, the Murderbot one. It's the first four novellas and the short story. And it's um, um, illustrated by Tommy Arnold. And the, the illustrations are beautiful. There's like, I think four or five interior black and white illustrations and he's done a new cover and then there's end papers and it's really gorgeous. It's sold out. <laughs> it's sold out like in 30 minutes or something, but um, cause they don't print that many, but uh, yeah, I haven't seen the, I've seen pieces of it, but I haven't seen the whole thing together in a book yet. So I'm really looking forward to that. It's going to be so exciting. Okay. And they're also, uh, well, I don't know if I, they're also doing network effect. I don't know if they've actually announced that oh. yet. So. I haven't seen the one for that, like put up yet. That's exciting. Yeah, I don't think that's, that's, I don't know how far along that one is. But it's our yeah. tiny secret reveal that it's coming. Keep your yeah. eyes open. <laughs> okay, so branching out a little bit more with you, um, what are you currently reading or what is the last thing you read, depending because COVID year has been crazy? Um, or, you know, what are some of your favorite things from last year's, from, or from anything you've read? I actually got my Goodreads up so I could remember this. The <laughs> things I've just read, I haven't, I kind of had a big gap in my reading because I, I hit a point last year where I just couldn't do much reading. Um, so I've read recently Soul Star, which is C.L. Polk's, the third book in her Kingston cycle and really enjoyed that. Um, I think it's been, before this, the second book was my favorite. Now this one is my favorite. Um, that's a great fantasy series. Fireheart Tiger by Aliot de Bodard. I love her stuff. Um, uh, I think I've read most of her things. She just also had Seven of Infinities come out, which is a science fiction. Fireheart Tiger is a fantasy and they're, they're I think it's a novella length. It's a novella, novelette or novella. Um, read uh, Remote Control, which is the new novella by Nettie Okorafor, which is fabulous. I love her stuff too. I think, again, I think I've read most of her books. Um, and also Winter's Orbit by Ma uh, Everina Maxwell, which is a queer uh, science fiction romance kind of set far flung future, um, tiny galactic empire trying to um, be better and stay together and that kind of thing. It's a really, really good book. Um, that's all the most recent stuff. I'm, I'm also reading um, The Burning God by R.F. Kuang, which is the third book in her trilogy that started with the Poppy War. I'm an hour from the end of Poppy War right now. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. It's, it's really grim and gritty. Uh, it's a, but it's so, it's such a gripping story. Um, and uh, Ring Shout by um, oh, Fenderson Clark. Um, so yeah, I haven't started that one yet. I've, I've loved his other books. Um, so that's basically, yeah, that's what I'm. That sounds amazing. Now we have like, we all get to like go extend our book reading list from that. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to flip over into some murder bot questions because I saved okay. them from my own because I assume when we get questions from the audience and everything, they're going to kind of go with that too. So like I told you, I, I polled a lot of people and every single one of them, their first question was about this. Um, will you ever write a Rise, of, Rise and Fall of Sanctuary Moon series or give us some like more juicy details about what happens in this? Because I've seen that the only detail we really have is that it was based on um, how to get away with murder. Yeah, it's kind of like how to get away with murder in space on a on a space colony with a lot more characters. Um, I don't know whether I would ever um, actually write things from it because it's so much more fun just to come up with weird stuff. I did a question and answer thing for um, Tor.com's Instagram, I think it was, 
where people and and several people asked various questions about Sanctuary Moon and what what was your favorite episode? And so I got that it was it was Murderbot and Art answering the questions. So I got that I got to make up a lot more stuff that had happened in it. Um, I can't remember much of it right now. It's like I think there was at some point there's a very devastating shuttle crash in the middle of a very personal argument <laughs> among several people, and and then someone gets cloned and replaced by their clone. I think, and and I can't remember. There's a whole bunch of other stuff, but it sounds so delightful. It's definitely a great like little squealy moment when you're like, ah, he's back to it again. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna uh, have to start incorporating more stuff that actually happens in it when mentioned in the books because that's really fun to come up with. And I'll just start like keeping a, a detailed note tab what's happening. Yeah, I need I need to remember them. I'm really bad at keeping notes on my own work. So I need to somewhere have a like a sanctuary moon document where I put in everything that supposedly happened on it. I love it. Um have the murder bot diaries ever been optioned for TV or film? Um, I can't, uh, really talk about that yet. Okay. So <laughs> that, uh, that happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, but hopefully there will be, you know, some news about that soon. I love it. <laughs> nice. Keep our, keep our eyes at, uh, and our ears open. So you've like in, in your writing career, you've run two Nebulas, two Hugos and two Locus Awards, five of which were all four murder bots. Mm -hmm. um, has it changed your process of how you approach writing the series and or your expectations of like the reception from your readers? I haven't won two nebulas. Oh wait, no, one? Yeah, one. I was trying to remember what was, I was like agreeing with you and I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> You're like, not that one. <laughs> I had a nebula nomination like way back oh, okay. when for Death of the Necromancer. But yeah, what was the question? It's, um, has like, having this kind of recognition, has it changed your process of how you continue writing the series? Um, not really, um, because it's kind of like my process is my process and it, it doesn't, not my, I, I would like to change it, but, but it doesn't, that doesn't really work out for me. Um, it does um, probably make me more nervous about hoping that the, the next books in this series match up Cause it's kind of like with the Rex, sir, hardly anybody's reading it. So I can kind of can do what I want. I'll just please myself. Have fun, so, <laughs> just have fun you know? Um, but when you really feel like a lot of people are really into it, then you start really kind of worrying more about, um, is this going to be what people are expecting? Is this going to be good? You know, they're going to enjoy this. Um, even when I'm doing things, you know, I don't know that people will like and, um, I know some people who still haven't read Network Effect because they're just afraid of the beginning. Um, it's so good. Where, <laughs> um, you know, arts, people think art is dead and <laughs> it's very upsetting. <laughs> it's, and, but um, yeah, so it does make me a lot more self-conscious about things, I think. Okay. Um, what else do I want to do? Before I hand it over to everybody, because we're about two minutes from two, um, do you have forthcoming projects that you can tell us about? Because if you don't, like if you can't talk about it, we understand. But like, what can we expect from Martha Wells in 2021? There should be an announcement from Tor uh, soon. Um, it, it, it would probably, it got delayed because of um, snowpocalypse here. And I think other things were going on with, with uh, uh, different people that uh, so uh, but it should be on the way uh, pretty soon um, and they'll be announced on tour.com uh, about what I'm doing next I am working on something else um, I finally managed to for for the like the first four months of the pandemic I didn't get any writing since four months maybe six months I didn't get any writing done and it was really um, uh, really not fun um, I'm, it, that's writing is my whole job. So uh, it was uh, sitting around being depressed mostly was what was going on. Um, so I'm finally started something new and I hope people will like it. Um, uh, and yeah, it's probably also, I sh I'll, I'll just babble on if no one stops me, but uh, I should wait for the announcements that Tor will make. Okay, 
So we'll keep our eyes open for that. Um, do we have questions from our chat? I have a few others, but uh, I'll hand it over to people if we have questions over there. And I think our librarian is going to read again. Up. I'll pop in. I've, I'll, uh, I'll ask one that's just come up, but I wanted to tie it into what you were just saying about, you know, for the first few months of the pandemic, I think everybody was experiencing so much depression, confusion, fright, you know, anxiety. Yeah. It's just really kind of knocked everybody for a loop. Um, but in a way it ties into this question. Um, he's asking, what was it, what's it like experiencing the ways that fandom and fan fiction has changed from cons and the print zines and sort of the old school to all the new ways people can interact like through social media and uh, online events and stuff like this. Because even before the, the pandemic, you know, you were starting to have more, you know, with the social media and everything, but especially over the last year, a lot of people have really learned how to live online. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. It's, it's kind of in, 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 it's from the beginning, you know, having the print fanzines up to now with uh, Archive of Our Own and the other, you know, going through fan fiction on mailing lists and then websites, mm -hmm. personal websites, and then now up to Archive of Our Own. Um, in some ways it's been great because um, it doesn't take money. Um, all it takes is, you know, your online connection. Um, it, I think it allows a lot bigger variety of fanfic because people aren't um, as worried about pouring everything into one story, which is gonna be in one fanzine. You know, you can kind of explore and do crazy stuff that you might not otherwise have wanted to do. Um, the other thing is um, fandom, like every kind of fandom, uh, fanfic fandom has also had a lot of uh, basically harassment and abuse. Uh, and again, being online just kind of makes everything more concentrated. And I think also the movement from fanzines, there was harassment and abuse in fanzine letter columns, basically. It's never been, it's never been absent from fandom. Mm -hmm. um, to mailing lists, mailing lists moving to things like live journal where there was a lot of fanfic posted to mm -hmm. made it basically where it sort of expanded things that used to stay between the small group of people who were all screaming at each other now a huge number of people who have absolutely no idea what's going on can jump in too <laughs> so it's just it's just kind of online that kind of that kind any kind of communication broad communication like that uh concentrates good things and it concentrates bad things and it's been the same with fanfic fandom. So um, it's well, just I wish the people who were getting into it had some sort of primer they could go to where it would say, okay, don't do <laughs> this. You know, it's like, uh, you know, ways to protect themselves and, um, you know, uh, just kind of um, little warnings and stuff like that but I don't think there's anything out there it's just like you know everyone just gets thrown into into the the, the blender without uh any any preparation I think fan fiction in general sadly anything that humans are involved in is always going to have a little bit of a toxic element to deal yeah. with um but I've found a lot of people you know even like talking murder bot with people uh you can also find a lot of support and friendship and connections yeah. that you wouldn't normally find and as you say a lot of people now again with the pandemic it's a comfort you know i've been rereading old books and re-watching old shows and so it's 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 great to have that sort of comfortable world to escape into <laughs> oh yeah and it's nice to be able to experience that with people and it's like actually the way i kind of do fandom now is um I have friends I've met through fandom that have, uh, we have a lot of the same interests. So I kind of like do fandom with my, with a, my friends I've known online for years and my, in my in-person friends and who are sometimes, sometimes both the groups interact, you know, and, and so, and know each other and, and move from one group to the other and that kind of thing. So um, that's the way I do it. Um, yeah. But yeah, it is an incredible comfort and in sharing that with people and getting to, you know, even just like dipping a toe in and getting to talk to people a little bit, you know, about your favorite show and everything. And just a quick note on that, because in 2019, uh, AO3, which is an archive of our own, one of the big fanfic, uh, won a Hugo. Yeah. Which I think kind of helped legitimize it a little bit for a lot of people, like a little bit of recognition and, you know. 
Yeah, the recognition helps, but I think of the fact that so many people that I know, I, I, I you know, read fanfic when they were, um, when they were in college or younger, and it's just that, that it's just like, it becomes more and more familiar um, with each generation. I was thinking about that, how you, you mentioned that, like, you know, a lot more authors are coming out with saying that, like, because it was where they started, it's where they got their feet wet. Yeah. We have to talk about how writing fanfic got them into being authors, because they were like, oh, I, you know, I learned how to write this way, even. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that, that they, they support, like, they support it doing it. Like you said, you can't read it because, you know, copyright yeah. and making sure you don't get other people's ideas mixed with yours. Um, but I like that there's, there is more support, because I can remember like 20 years ago, uh, where we were basically the authors who were like, don't ever touch my stuff. We don't look at that part of the world. Um, and now it's sort of a more more inclusive, whether they're involved or not, that that people acknowledge that this is part of um, yeah. media, just whether it's reading or writing or watching, um, that it's just part of the, the experience now. Yeah, I know. I think so. And I think also like, again, in the 90s, what I remember is uh, people... Uh, being afraid to admit they wrote fanfic because there was a lot of derision and everything and of course because it's mostly it's a lot of women you know and now of course um, that was always the perception though I don't think that was ever true you know there were non-binary people there were guys there you know it was it was it was everybody but it was it had that impression of being a thing that girls did and so naturally it had to be mocked and so, um, which is the same with romance and, and in, you know, God knows real estate, anything that, that women are seen as doing more often than in anybody else. But I think we're finally getting away from that now. And there's just too many people, it's kind of hit that limit where there's where that, that precipice where so many people have uh, read it or had their kids read it and they kind of, they start reading it. And then it's like, oh, well, this is not really, anything scary or weird or a big deal this is just stories and people telling stories about stuff they like and actually it tends to be a great way to grow a fandom because mm -hmm. you start reaching people you wouldn't always necessarily reach for whatever specific you know fandom. yeah and there are there were so many rumors back then um i remember like hearing rumors that if you had ever written fanfic no publisher would buy your book and I'm sure there were people who believed that as gospel. And it's like, you guys have to understand, this is just somebody's making this, this, this yeah. stuff up, you know? It's just, that's just not, that's like saying, you know, well, if you haven't read Shakespeare, no author will buy your, uh -huh. no publisher will buy your book. And then people would say things like that too. You know, I shouldn't use that as an example, but, but just stuff, it's, it's so arbitrary. It's like, it can't possibly matter. Yeah. <laughs> so uh yeah so it's like i think they're the the problem with it in the 90s was just there was so much rumors and 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 you know there was there was like stigma against it stigma yeah and uh, and that's gone away as it's as it's become more popular and more easily accessible and um you know more people are into it i actually had a question it's actually a throwback to earlier you were talking about a uh, cereal box and machina um and about it being, you know, terraforming more, terra I can't speak, terraforming Mars with AI. Mm -hmm. um, and just wondering, uh, you know, just recently Perseverance landed and there's hopefully going to be a helicopter flying around on Mars soon. Really cool. You, you know, what do, you, what do you think about that? And will that affect any sort of, of your space related and travel related, you know? Well, the problem with science fiction. Murder bot come true, but it's starting. <laughs> yeah, the problem with science fiction is trying to keep up with everything that keeps actually happening in real life and you don't want to make your universe seem too dated and um that is a big problem um like i think i had for network effect there's a there was like a little self-driving car and i think my editor said you know this is we have this now <laughs> so it's like it needs to be somehow less it has to be more than just that it's like oh yeah i forgot we have self-driving cars so yeah, so it's just like trying to keep ahead of the technology. Um, and we're already kind of seeing things like that are kind of offshoots of the Google Glass, you know, when they're wanting to put a, you know, a, a chip in your head so you can have the internet there and, you know, and like that can't possibly go wrong and, um, and all the other things. And so, um, yeah, so that's always been a problem. Uh, um, 
And that's what kind of why I've always liked fantasy and where I can kind of create the world and we can have whatever we want in it and not have to worry about reality outpacing us before the book comes out. I was actually going to say, do you, do they, I mean, I'm sure, you know, anything you write, you know, it's your baby and you're going to like, you know, you wouldn't do it if you didn't enjoy it. But do you, do you prefer in general, like just in reading or fandoms or stuff, fantasy, science fiction, you know? Kind of, kind of both. Um, I've always, I've always, you know, liked both. I, I, um, you tend to only get asked about what you're writing now. So it's funny because up until Murderbot came out, I was only asked about fantasy. Um, when my Star Wars novel came out, I would could, I was suddenly was only a Star Wars author, even though I'd only done the one novel and I couldn't get panels on anything but Star Wars. <laughs> It's, that was kind of frustrating. And now Murderbot, I can't get asked anything about anything but science fiction. But um, I've always liked both. I've always read, you know, all kinds of stuff. I read mysteries too a lot. So um, I've never been kind of focused in one area. Oh, but the other funny thing about Mars was Elon Musk coming out and saying, well, why don't you become my indentured servants and go to Mars? Oh. <laughs> <That was exciting. laughs> You know, I just, I, I didn't, I wrote Murderbot not as a goal that the world should, you know, <laughs> to aspire to. <laughs> it was not to be aspired to. It's supposed to warn people about doing this kind of stuff. Well, not have, you know, go, oh yeah, that's great. Let's do that. I said, whenever you have humans involved. <laughs> whenever you have humans involved, humans, humans can screw up an amazing amount of stuff. One human can just wreck yeah stuff for so many other humans it's not even funny <laughs> but at the same time not to be too negative i know a lot of humans that can make the world better for a lot of people yeah that's true we have to keep remembering that it's in one thing it's it's so much easier to remember negative things that happen than positive yes. things that's well, that's the real problem i'm i'm slightly hinting at authors here because i know from when i could read till now i still a good book to me is the best therapy because you can just escape and enjoy it and you know i i can't do it but i really appreciate people that can <laughs> yeah i um i think that's so i mean it's like i would not have gotten through childhood i don't think if i didn't have books and it just really gosh I, I can't remember anything about the research of talking about reading a novel um being almost like rewiring your brain it is yes. and it teaches you empathy more than almost anything other than yeah. contact mm -hmm. yeah I'm not sure it works for everybody I think it's like if you have there's some people that seem to like really distance when they talk about stuff is really distanced from their reading like I really like get into it and you know, I'm not even like imagining myself as the protagonist. It's like, I just like want to strip my identity away and just play the book in my head like it's a movie or something and just kind of be into it. Um, and I know everybody probably reads differently. You know, we're finding out more and more about how our brains work and, and uh, <clears throat> in, in unexpected ways we didn't really think about before, but. Yeah. And I just had one more question that I'd taken um, and it's a little bit more to do with the process. Um, they were just wondering, like how long does it take you to write like a book or a novella? Um, and do you do you sort of outline everything or are you kind of the, I think they call it the outline or the seat of the pants? The pantser, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm definitely a pantser. Uh, I don't generally outline. It doesn't usually help me. Um, I'm one of those people that other pantsers were talking about the fact that it feels like the story is complete in your head, in part of your brain. It will not, it refuses to communicate it with the rest of your brain. You have to guess, you know, maybe this. It's like, no, maybe this. No, getting colder. No. And it's like, okay, this. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's getting a little warmer. And then that's what the writing is like. Um, I've had to outline occasionally for um, the media tie-ins because they generally want you to submit an outline before uh, you write. And sometimes it's been helpful in like kind of reminding me of what where I was going. And other times it's like, I can't really um, um, visualize action scenes in particular unless I'm actually writing the scene. And I come up with so much stuff that's really important uh, when I'm actually writing that I can't come up with in an outline. Um, it's kind of like when they tell people to, if you're having trouble with a pop, plot, a plot problem, um, 
explain the problem to someone else because just thinking about it in your head, you're going to be glossing over things you don't really understand or ways you or, or problems and stuff. You'll just won't, you'll just kind of not acknowledge them to yourself. When you actually have to make another person understand, you'll suddenly hit like, oh, it's not working because this just doesn't work. This, this, you know, this is logistically, this is not going to happen. So it's that kind of thing. And so um, with outlines, I don't really get that. I just kind of like will have vague, you know, this sounding good in the outline, but when I get there, I realize I've put most of the action off stage and all these people that are doing this actually need to be here in the middle. And, you know, this is not very important and it's just gonna be a, a throwaway line or something. So, yeah, so they've just never helped me that much. And um, occasionally like All Systems Red came to me basically all at once. And though originally it was a short story. And so I had to kind of expand it into when I realized I, I want to do a bit more and um, it will work better as a novella. So I had to expand it a little bit. Do but you, that's kind do of you rare. To do that or does your, I mean, like do, does the publisher come to you and say, no, we want it longer, or we want it shorter or do you decide that? No, I've never had them. I, I'm sure they have at times because I've noticed, especially there was, um, there's been a few times where a large fantasy novel has been cut into two. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not always the best thing for the book because books are generally, you know, there's that rising action or, or, you know, rising tension to climax and splitting it in two often doesn't work. Um, so no, I've never really had a publisher tell me that. Um, I, you know, well, I, I've, like I told, sometimes you usually have to give them uh, a length, you know, sort of occasionally, like YA books are usually under 70, that 70 to 80,000 or something, though they can be longer. Fancy books are usually expected to be a bit longer than um, mysteries or science fiction or whatever, but it's always kind of a guideline. Um, I thought, I thought uh, network effect would be about 90,000 words and I passed 90,000, I was still going. And usually when I estimate that, I know about, I hit it about right. And I was emailing my editor and telling him, well, it's, it's not going to be 90. It might be a hundred. And then I got to hundred it's like, it might be 110. And he's like, I don't care. <laughs> whatever you want to do we honestly don't care how long it is and um I'm like okay so um it was around 112 I think is what it came out but mm -hmm. so um you and usually with a short story or novella market um there's a limit like short story is it, it depends on the magazine it can be longer now I think because of online magazines with print magazines they were usually they wanted stories under 5,000 words or under 7,000 words. Um, there's still usually limits like that, but I don't think they're as hard and fast in some ways, depending on what the story is. Um, a novella technically is under 40,000 words. So anything under 39,000 words, I, I can't remember what a novelette is. I think it's like 17 or something. Yeah, right in the middle-ish. Yeah. Which I didn't existed until the Hugos. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I have an argument online with people that wanted to call, you know, a novelette was a short novel. And it's like, no, a novelette is a long short story. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. Um, I didn't make it up. <laughs> that's just how it is. But yeah, so you have links like that. And those are um, basically mostly helpful for categorizing things. So you're not for especially for awards and stuff so you're not pitting a short story against a novel or something like that we just had another question come in um, saying it's cool that you've worked collaboratively on some media properties like star wars and magic the gathering is there a property or a shared world that you'd be interested in participating in um i don't know uh, i think the most i i don't i didn't work that collaboratively on star wars uh, Magic the Gathering, I did. I got to work with um, Nick Kelman, who was my editor, and then other people in the in the the story team and the world building team um, were weighing in on what we were doing, and that was a lot of fun. Um, doing stuff like, okay, I need this to happen, but I'm not sure it works with what we've what the world's established because there's like 50 years of backstory for Magic the Gathering and everything, and 
they said, yeah, but they like it. So go ahead and do it. But then the world building team will think of a way that this works because it didn't have to be explained until the next writer was coming in. So it's like, okay, yay. So that was a fun experience. I, I enjoyed working for Magic the Gathering a lot. Um, what I'd like to do, <laughs> my cats are growling in the background. I don't know if you can hear that. They hate each other. Um, the, um, doc I'm a big Doctor Who fan. So it'd be neat to write a Doctor Who story at some point. Um, I don't have time to do it ever, but that would be neat to do. Um, that would be awesome. I'm really loving, um, I love Star Trek Discovery, um, which is kind of a slow burn thing where you really don't see what's going on with it until the end of the first season. And suddenly it's like this whole thing has been actually like a mystery so that they didn't know they were involved in. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was really cool. And I also really loved Star Trek Lower Decks, which is, I, I don't think I know enough Star Trek to write that show because it's so comprehensively knowledgeable about everything that's happened. But it's almost, it's, it's so hilarious. And yet it's also like a serious meta commentary on all of Star Trek. So um, I'd love to be on, in, uh, involved with something like that, but I don't think I'm I'm knowledgeable enough to, to write it. Um, it's just, I just, each little, a little episode is just a little brilliant gem. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's, a. I mean, there's probably other stuff, but um, I think that's about it. I've kind of done, you know, I really love Stargate and Stargate Atlantis. I've kind of already done, you know, been involved with those. So um, yeah, for now, that's probably, I'm sure there'll be something else I'd like to be. As a quick aside to that, I know you said that you aren't really planning to write Sanctuary Moon as a separate story, but when you're imagining it, do you ever particular, do you picture anyone in particular as some of the characters? Uh, not really, because it's, uh, well, sometimes, yeah, sometimes no. Uh, we were talking earlier about how, what a mess Sanctuary Moon is for how many different, different storylines and stuff have been mentioned. Um, it's based on how to get away with murder, but a lot more characters on a, in space. And, and um, so some, some, um, sometimes I do imagine and, some, um, and other times I'm just kind of thinking of plot lines, crazy plot lines that would be funny for them to do, or not really funny, but just would, would sort of sound realistic enough, but with something really kind of strange in them, which is hard to beat because there's one of the, there's a show they mention at the end of Network Effect that Art and Murderbot get into. It's actually based on, um, oh God, uh, Legends of Tomorrow, uh -huh. which, Trying to describe anything that happens in Legends of Tomorrow sounds like you're coming up with BS that happened on Sanctuary Moon. Uh, that's that's been with Doom Patrol. <laughs> Doom Patrol, yeah. Uh, so I I have to I have to go back and ask the question. Um, if you are like if your your dreamy one for if you ever had time was Doctor Who, um, top one or two or three doctors you would uh, love to write a story about. Oh, I think David Tennant is still my favorite, but I did like Matt Smith. Um, I liked um, um, Peter Capaldi when he was with Bill. Um, I, th I liked the story they were doing with him and Claire and how she ended up, um, how she ended up leaving. I thought that was really, that turned out really well, but it wasn't as fun as what I like from Doctor Who. It was more serious. Their relationship and everything was happening was so serious. So I really liked him with Bill, where they were, you're seeing everything through her eyes. It was kind of new. Oh, yeah. And um, so I would, I would wish they would have done more episodes or started that earlier with her so we could have seen more Bill. Um, I really love that character. And I think he was a lot more um, fun as the doctor when he was with her in that kind of like grandfatherly mentor role. Um, I also like um, the new doctor. Um, I love that. I like the fact that she has more companions and it's more of a family feeling because it was, it was always fun when they had more companions and you know you could kind of see. I like that ensemble cast stuff a lot. So I really like the fact that they did that. And again, it was kind of made it new and fun with her. We just ask one last time if we have any more questions from our attendees to type it in now. We're getting close to our hour. Um, Amanda, I didn't know if you had any other questions or. Um, 
Do you want me to give it like 30 seconds to a minute to see if we get a question? And if yeah. not, I can if, if you have, I thought you said earlier you had one waiting. I, like, I do, I have like two. Um, <laughs> So one of the big discussions uh, I've had with people, whether it's with my book club or just other people who've read your book, mm -hmm. um, is that thing where people finally hit the realization of not being sure what the sexuality slash pronoun of the character is, um, whether they come at it because like the POV is I, um, or it's that um, someone listened to the audiobook and so it's done by a male voice. So they assumed it was male. Um, how did you approach that? And how are you handling like his burgeoning personhood? His, um, her, it, they, <laughs> like, let me not assume. Yeah, it's, um, well, from the beginning, I kind of realized it, the way I have this set up with the company, it doesn't make sense that they would assign a gender mm -hmm. because it's just not, uh, they were just literally not thinking of them as human enough. Um, so, and Murderbot's kind of forged its own way in that regard. Um, and it's not, really interested in sex of, of any it's not even interested in hearing or seeing any kind of sex yeah. it, it, it couldn't be less interested so that's sort of not going to be something that's ever going to come up with for it um the thing i think is weird of the number of people i've seen people just sort of insist that murderbot is a woman or murderbot is a guy and um and having to say no <laughs> and i usually try to stay out of that conversation because usually there's someone who will come along and have it for me <laughs> and argue about it. Yeah. But um, it has been weird um, because Murderbot, it, I guess I, it caught me all by surprise because Murderbot states very clearly in the book that it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't have um, uh, an assigned gender. It, it considers itself, um, I don't even know if you could describe it as non-binary. It, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't. Sort of non-existent. It's Not gender is, is murder bot, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and it it says it pretty clearly that it's not, you know, it says it several times, it emphasizes over and over again, it's not interested in sex, in human sexuality at all. So um, I guess I wasn't prepared for people to start insisting that no, it did have a gender, it just didn't know what it was. And it's like, I'm not sure it works like that. Um, so yeah, so it's just been really kind of unexpected. And actually when All Systems Red came out, one of my friends looked through the Goodreads stuff and actually did the percentage of who referred to Murderbot, how many people referred to Murderbot as he, how many to she, how many they, which would be more accurate and how many actually used it and how many kind of avoided it altogether. And it was kind of even, so it was, it was, it was interesting. So that wasn't something I was anticipating at all. I guess people, I just expected people to take the character at its word mm -hmm. and not try to, you know, that's one thing that's, that's one thing I find vaguely annoying whenever I retweet fan art. Um, almost every time someone will say, aha, this explains everything. Murderbot is a woman or Murderbot yeah. is a man. And it's like, no, this is an artist I, representation, an artist's idea from that they interpreted from the book and it doesn't and it doesn't mean and just because someone has short hair doesn't mean they're a man mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so you know it's like you can't take um fan art and suddenly say okay well martha wells said this and it's like no martha wells retweeted an artist <laughs> <laughs> who drew a picture of what they had in their head that doesn't really that doesn't really um solve anything and it's not really a question that needs to be solved sure. yeah. So um, yeah, it's just been a very interesting getting into those waters and just sort of being like, man, people will ask stuff that, you know, <laughs> you would, you're like- I don't always oh, want to hear the answer. I don't always want to hear, don't want to hear the answer. You know, it's like, I can't believe you're asking this about a fictional character. I hope you don't ask it about real people. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> oh. I also love that we have the burgeoning personhood of another one sort of like from network effects um yeah sort of seeing another secondary almost not quite to mentor type thing because you know murder brought very much was like hands off on all the things <laughs> but suddenly we do have a second yeah so um and three will be different we'll have to i i haven't really done any development yet um 
because I was trying to write, I was, was trying to write a sequel to Network Effect when the pandemic hit and it just kind of bombed out. I couldn't get, I didn't have the concentration to be able to do it. So um, when I finally am able to go back to that, um, I'll start working on three and I kind of really won't know very much. Of, I don't really know what I'm going to do right now. Until it starts happening. Until it starts happening, until I kind of get into the character more and, and write more from its perspective. Okay. We have one last question from, uh, from our attendees um, saying that, uh, I know you said earlier that, uh, that uh, All Systems Red came to you sort of fully formed, but they were wondering like what triggered the idea? What was the idea that sort of went, <gasps> I don't know. Um, it's, that's always a really kind of a weird question because usually I don't remember what triggered the idea if anything did uh -huh. because um, my brain can go, goes very fast sometimes and not very accurate or uh, so sometimes I just don't really know. The first scene that came to me was Dr. Mensa talking to Murderbot in the cubicle where she kind of knocks on the cubicle and that's kind of that act of transgression that kind of sets off the rest of the story. Um, but I don't know where I got that from. I just was thinking about, I was having a lot of this little kind of creative surge after working so hard on Harbors of the Sun. And actually I hadn't finished it actually at that point. I had to kind of, I wrote that scene down. I was gonna make a few notes for the, for the idea and ended up writing that scene down, writing about five pages of the beginning. Um, and then having to go back to Harbors of the Sun which I then I finished and then then realized after talking to a friend realized no the ending doesn't work I need to go back and I added like a hundred pages <laughs> to it so um, but I was really proud of how that book turned out though but I was just having all these ideas and you know for all kinds of different stuff and writing down notes and and that was one of them oh, cool. okay and did you have anything left Miss Amanda um. I think I'm good since we're- I mean, we could keep you here all day, but we don't. We're going to limit ourselves. For another hour, but. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. I want to say thank you so oh. much for coming um, to Martha and thank you for moderating to Amanda. Um, it's been great talking to you and you're, you're a return uh, author for our uh, Pop Madness. So maybe if you are feeling like you want to come in person next year, if we can do it in person. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> I'm hoping and hopefully you can do your book tour and everything, you know, get that all all going soon. So fingers crossed. Um, but I just want to say a huge thank you and to all of our attendees that are watching. Thank you for coming and joining us today. And I've had a wonderful time and I've learned so much. So thank you very, very much. And I'll be keeping an eye out for everything that you said's coming you soon. All these updates that might be coming. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed talking to you all. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. You too.